Okay, hello everyone. I think we can start with the session. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming to this session. My name is Martin. Just last year here at uh, Vox Days Vienna, I spoke about the security sandbox model of the Java platform. And we touched upon very briefly about how does the new module system in Java 9 affect uh, the Java ecosystem. Uh, today in this session, basically, I'll cover what are the new Java 9 security enhancements. And I'll show you some examples to get a better idea on how to apply them in practice. Um, so just before we start with the actual session, my name is Martin. <coughs> uh, I'm working for a company called Coffee Com Consulting, where I'm a Java consultant. I'm also one of the guys who helps organize the events of the Bulgarian Java user group. And I'm also a very big open JDK enthusiast. And you can follow me on Twitter. I tweet mostly about Java. So in this session, basically, we'll first do a short recap on what is the TLS or the transport layer security support uh, up to JDK 9. And then based on that knowledge, we'll cover what are the new security enhancements in Java 9, such as DTLS or datagram, datagram transport layer security, ALPN, which is a very interesting extension on the TLS handshake protocol. And we'll also review the rest of the security enhancements at a glance. As you know, Java 9 has uh, a very major uh, introduction, which is the Jigsaw module system. And one of the nice things about the Jigsaw module system is that it doesn't affect the security sandbox model of the Java platform. This means that we can use the security manager scheme with the permission checking that's been implemented since Java 1.2 and apply that uh, to Jigsaw modules without any change. One of the new things that has been introduced in the Java 9 module system is the possibility to specify concrete permissions per Jigsaw module with a new syntax that extends the format of the security policy file. Another thing that uh, Jigsaw allows us in terms of security is to basically improve the security of our applications. And based on the way we deploy modules in our application, we can remove some code that is unnecessary and in that way improve the security of our application. <laughs> And this is, in fact, one of the goals also of the Jigsaw module system, to improve the security of the JDK itself. By building a smaller JDK out of modules that you only need, you just, need, you just improve the security of, of the JDK. Um, OK, so let's get started. Um, first, what do we have in Java 9 uh, in terms of TLS support? So basically, what I'll cover here is a short recap of how does uh, Java support uh, the transport layer protocol? And based on that knowledge, we'll uh, discuss the new security enhancements. So up to JDK 9, we have several versions of the TLS protocol supported by J the JDK. Uh, and these are versions 1.0, 1.1, and 1.2. Uh, and currently, there is a version 1.3 uh, which is ongoing in terms of being specified in a formal specification. And that version will be supported in later versions of the JDK eventually. And as most of you know, TLS is the predecessor of the SSL protocol. It allows you to secure communication over the internet. You can enable TLS in your organization. Typically, one of the best practices that most organizations enable is to enable TLS in all layers of communication between the different applications within the organization. However, there are other interesting use cases behind TLS. And that's the ability to uh, enable SSL VPNs. Uh, some of you probably, uh, when they need to connect from home to your organization's network, uh, probably they need to go over an SSL VPN solution. And just before we discuss the, what are the security enhancements in Java 9, we need to understand how the TLS handshake process works. This is, in fact, the process that triggers just before we establish secure communication between a client and the server. And the first step uh, which happens in a TLS negotiation is that the client proposes to the server the TLS version and the cryptographic shifters that are supported by the client. The server receives that request from the client, negotiates what is the TLS version, the shifter that's supported by the server and the client, and also sends back to the client the server certificate which contains the public key of the server. Uh, at this second step, uh, the client receives the response from the server, uh, then fetches the server's certificate, and probably does some certificate uh, verification. Certificate verification allows the client to make sure that the certificate that the server presents is valid. And the way the client does this is using uh, 
a protocol which is called OCSP or a certificate revocation list. And typically those two mechanisms are exposed by a, a certificate authority to which the client connects. The client basically looks into the CA search file which is part of the JDK and tries to determine whether the server certificate is valid against any of those certificate authorities presented. If that's not the case, then TLS negotiation fails. Uh, when the client verifies the server certificate, uh, it optionally may send its own public certificate to the server, uh, and this is used in case we need to establish bidirectional communication between the client and the server, and the server on its own hand may verify the client certificate. When the client sends the client certificate, it also sends the generated secret key that is used to encrypt the communication between the client and the server. And at that point, the client and the server negotiate that they've finished the TLS negotiation phase. At that point, we have the generated secret key that is used to encrypt the communication between the client and the server. So this is basically the TLS handshake process at a glance. And based on that process, uh, there are different extensions that are provided by upcoming specifications of the TLS protocol to adapt more functionality to that process. And up to JDK 9, uh, TLS is supported by means of the so-called Java Secure Socket extension, which is a sec the secure equivalent of the standard Java sockets as you know them. Uh, this is implemented by means of the so-called Java Cryptography Architecture Provider. Uh, by default, the JDK provides a cryptographic provider which is called Sun JSSE or Sun Java Secure Socket Extension Provider. Uh, the core classes of that provider are part of the JavaX.NET and JavaX.NET SSL packages. And basically, the Secure Socket Extension in the JDK provides two modes of operation. One is the standard Secure Socket mode or the blocking mode of operation, which works pretty similar to how standard sockets work. Uh, the only ma major difference here is that you need to set more parameters such as key stores, trust stores, and so on. We'll see some examples. And there is also a much more complex mode of operation, which is the non-blocking mode of operation, which is established by means of the SSL channel API. One interesting uh, uh, wrapper around uh, the TLS support in JDK is the HTTPS URL connection class which is used to allow uh, simplified communication between HTTPS endpoints. So basically, it's a wrapper class around uh, the secure socket extension. And to look into more details into the two modes of operation, uh, the secure socket, uh, the blocking mode of operation is provided by the SSL socket class. Uh, as we already said, it's used in the same manner as a regular socket. And the most important point here is when is the TLS handshake process triggered? So basically TLS handshake may be triggered at three different steps. First one is if you call explicitly the start handshake method on the socket. This triggers the whole TLS handshake process that we saw a few slides ago. Another way to trigger the TLS handshake is if you try to get the session from the socket. The socket checks whether TLS handshake has been triggered and if not it triggers the TLS handshake process. And the third way to trigger the handshake process is by trying to read or write to the SSL socket. These are the three ways that behind the scenes uh, the socket API uh, in the JDK triggers the TLS handshake. And to be more specific, here is an example of uh, how this works. This is an example of a secure socket extension server. First we set uh, a, a property, Java property, which is javax.net SSL key store which specifies the location of our key store where the server stores, stores its public certificate that's sent to the client. And then we also set a password for this uh, key store. Then we use an SSL server socket factory, which is basically a factory class that allows us to create uh, server sockets. And from that SSL server socket factory, we create a server socket on port 4444. And what we do is we accept some connection on the server socket. This operation, as, as you might guess, is blocking. So at that point, we, we wait for some uh, request to be received on the server. Then we read the input from, from that request. And while we have something in the input stream, we print out some message. And, and at the end, we make sure that we close basically the socket and the connection. So this is a very simple example of how a SSL socket server looks like. And on the client side, uh, we, we have something quite similar.
first we set two properties that identify the trust store for the client. The trust store stores a list of the certificate authorities that are uh, trusted by the client and that are specified in the CA certs file, which is part of the JDK installation. So we first set the location of the trust store, then we set some password for the trust store. Then again, we use an SSL socket factory to create the SSL client socket. Uh, we click create the client socket uh, on localhost, again on port 4444. And then we write something to the server. Um, when we do that, we finally make sure that we close this, the client socket and the corresponding streams. This is a very simple example of how an SSL client looks like. And the second mode of operation of the Java Secure Socket extension, or the non-blocking mode of operation, is much more complex than the standard socket SSL socket mode. Uh, it's provided by a class called SSL Engine, and this class makes use of two methods which are called wrap and unwrap to read and write uh, to write and read data uh, to the SSL Engine. And how this is done? Basically, we write some data to an application byte buffer, which is basically a buffer on the application side that receives the packets that are to be written uh, to the network. Then we use the wrap method to send those uh, packets to, to a network byte buffer from which they're sent over to the network. And when we receive data using the SSL engine class, we read that data using the unwrap method from the network byte buffers and write it back to the application byte buffers from where our application handles it. Uh, and it's a much more complex API to use than the SSL socket API. However, uh, the, SS the TLS handshake process might be triggered uh, using the SSL engine class, again in three distinct steps. First is if you call begin handshake method on the SSL engine class, this triggers the TLS handshake process in the similar way as we do with the SSL socket. Or if we call the wrap or unwrap methods and TLS handshake hasn't been triggered, then it's triggered by any of those two methods. This is in general how the non-blocking mode of operation works. As we said, it's much more complex than the SSL socket API. Uh, and it's typically used with an API which is predates uh, Java 9, which is called Socket Channel. However, since it's a much more complex API uh, that you need to debug when you ro work with it, you may need to enable some properties that allow you to inspect what happens during uh, the TLS handshake process or during the TLS communication. And in order to do that, you can use the property javax.net.debug. If you set that property to all, you'll see all the information that flows through the client and the server. And you can make this information more fine-grained by specifying just specific parts of the SSL process that you would like to inspect. For example, if you specify only handshake, you'll see only messages that are exchanged between the client and the server when, you, when the TLS handshake process is triggered. Or you can specify SSL. This will show you only messages that are exchanged between the client and the server after the TLS process is established. So far, so good. Now let's see based on that uh, what we have in Java in JDK 9. Or uh, the first thing that I'll cover is DTLS. So DTLS basically is uh, TLS over an unreliable transport protocol as UDP. Many applications such as chat clients or other types of business applications require unreliable communication, which also needs to be secured. So DTLS covers all those use cases of uh, applications running on top of an unreliable uh, communication protocol such as UDP. However, in DTLS, as is similar to UDP, uh, reliability and in-order delivery are not, are not guaranteed by the protocol, as is the case with uh, TLS over TCP. This is something that the application developer needs to establish at the application level. Uh, also, DTLS targets to secure uh, protocols such as DNS, SIP, and so on and so forth, just to name a few. Uh, also, DTLS follows the TLS specifications that are specific to DTLS, and uh, DTLS is currently 1.3 in draft mode. Uh, when this specification is ready, DTLS, would, uh, DTLS for that version of the specification would be supported in the JDK as well. Some differences between DTLS and TLS. Uh, first, in the DTLS uh, protocol uh, packet, we have a new field which is called sequence number. As you might guess, since basically DTLS packets are not guaranteed uh, in terms of order, we need to have a field that identifies the sequence number of the concrete DTLS packet. Uh, 
Uh, also, we have some su dropped support for cryptographic shifters like RC4 that are not supported by the DTLS protocol. Uh, we also have a retransmission timer for resending of packets. Uh, as we already said, uh, reliable delivery is not guaranteed in DTLS. And for that reason, we need another field that allows us to make sure that we, need, we can establish reliable delivery if we need to. And there are also two other differences with the TLS protocol. One is that MAC verification failure triggers warning instead of failure. In standard TLS, if there is uh, MAC verification failure, this will fail the negotiation process. Uh, and in, um, in DTLS, that's not the case. And also, we have a new request that allows us to additionally identify the sender of the request. And now, in JDK 9, we have support for DTLS 1.2 and 1.0. And implementation is adapted to the Java Secured Socket Extension API, as we saw earlier. Uh, SSL engine class is used basically to provide support for DTLS um, in JDK 9, which means that the D DTLS API in JDK 9 is non-blocking API. Uh, and typically, the SSL engine class is used with the Datagram Socket API to, to provide support for DTLS in Java 9. Implementation is uh, based on the SSL engine API class, as we already mentioned, which makes usage of DTLS a bit hard at first. As I already mentioned, the SSL Engine API is fairly complex to use, and it's not very widely adopted in the Java community. Uh, so if you want to get started with DTLS in JDK 9, it's, I would say, uh, a bit non-trivial. And if basically you use Java 9 or earlier versions, I would still recommend that you go with some third-party library like Bouncy Castle. They have a Bouncy Castle Java Secured Socket Extension provider which provides implementation for, for DTLS, which is much simpler to use. It's just a few lines of code. Uh, in JDK 9, however, if you want to get started with uh, DTLS, there are a number of tweaks that you need to make to your code to make it work correctly. Another option you can adopt is to use uh, OpenSSL via JNI. OpenSSL also provides implementation for DTLS. Um, now, in JDK 9, uh, however, there are some specifics to the implementation of DTLS. Order delivery, as I said, is uh, not guaranteed by DTLS. However, for the purpose of handshake, uh, TLS handshake in JDK 9, uh, automatic order delivery is automatically provided by the SSL engine class. So you don't need to make sure that during the handshake process you establish order delivery of packets. Uh, also, the sequence number can be retrieved by a new method, which is called sequence number uh, from the SSL engine results class. And, however, if you need to make sure that you redeliver packets that have failed to deliver in DTLS, you need to, make, uh, to implement that in your application. So you need to make sure that redelivery happens on the application side. And, um, yeah, as I already said, in DTLS, handshake messages must be delivered properly. And that step here is required only for the TLS handshake process. So the SSL engine API makes sure that during handshake, delivery of packets uh, is guaranteed. And to get started with DTLS, here is a, a very brief example. Uh, you get an SSL context instance uh, for DTLS by calling SSL context.get instance DTLS. Then you initialize that SSL context with some parameters, and then cre you create an SSL engine instance from that SSL context. When you create the SSL in engine instance, you can start establishing communication uh, using the wrap and unwrap methods. Um, however, there are not many good examples on DTLS, uh, either in the JDK documentation or over the net. So if, if you want to see uh, how it really works in practice, Some good examples are provided by the OpenJDK 9 test suite. There are five or six unit tests that cover DTLS to some degree. So if you want to see how this is implemented in JDK 9, I would suggest you see the OpenJDK 9 test suite. Now, to give a more insight about a new uh, API that's in JDK 9, that's the TLS application layer protocol negotiation extension which is much simpler to understand than the DTLS support provided in JDK 9. And uh, the application layer protocol negotiation extension is a way that allows you to identify the application protocol between the client and the server. 
Uh, in fact, it also does not require additional round trips to achieve that. This all happens during the TLS handshake process. And during the TLS handshake process, when the client and the server exchange uh, packets, they might also negotiate the applic application protocol that's being used between them. Uh, an interesting use case behind this is HTTP.0, 2.0. Uh, if you have a web server that supports both HTTP 1.1 and 2.0, but you have different clans that support different versions of the protocol, you can use that extension to establish the proper application protocol between the HTTP client and the server. And also another interesting property of uh, the LPN extension is that you can, the server can send different public certificates based on the application protocol. So for example, if you have an HTTP web server, it can send one public certificate to an HTTP 1.1 client and a completely different certificate to an HTTP.0 uh, client. And to give you an example of how ALPN works, uh, when you basically create uh, a server socket or a client socket, you, you get the SSL parameters from the corresponding socket. And on those parameters, you call the set application protocols method, which accepts just an array of strings, which identify the names of the application protocols that the client or the server supports. Here, this might be either a client or a server socket. And the same thing can be applied on the SSL engine API or the non-blocking mode of operation. Again, you get the SSL parameters from the SSL engine instance, and you set the application protocols that the client on the server supports. When you do that, you trigger the handshake process uh, from the client on the s or the server by calling start handshake uh, or begin handshake, depending on which mode you, you use. Uh, and then you can get the negotiated application protocol after the TLS handshake process is established by calling the get application protocol method on the SSL socket or SSL engine instance. This basically will return you a string which says what is the identified application protocol. There is a much more advanced uh, way to use application layer protocol negotiation. And uh, basically, you can specify custom uh, protocol selector, which uses a more advanced mechanism to specify, to specify how to negotiate the application protocol on the server side. On the SSL server socket, you call a method called set, ha set handshake application protocol selector. And you specify, uh, in that particular case, this is a lambda that accepts two parameters. One is the SSL server socket and the list of client protocols that the client suggests to the server. In that particular case, I get the current TLS handshake session from the server socket. I get the cryptographic shifter that's been negotiated between the client and the server. And I also get the negotiated packet buffer size between the client and the server. And if the negotiated cryptographic shifter is RC4, and the size of the packets is larger than uh, 124 uh, bytes, then I return protocol one, other, otherwise I return protocol two. This is a more advanced way to determine which application protocol you want to use between the client and the server. Now, to give you some more details on uh, what we've seen so far, uh, I'll use a custom banking application server. This is a plain Java application that basically provides different modules which implement different kinds of protocols that work within that banking application server. We have protocols like FIX, Alpha, XMPP, and SIP. And also, this banking application server supports different kinds of applications that can use those protocols to interact with different applications within the bank, for example. Now, let's see how we can <coughs> implement this. For the banking server, I have a fairly simple uh, project which basically makes use of the so-called service loader mechanism. So the banking server loads its applications from the class path. And uh, how many of you have used the service loader utility? Two people. Okay, so it's not a widely used utility, but in fact in Java 9, this is the utility that the Jigsaw module system uses to discover uh, different kinds of services that are specified between the Jigsaw modules. So in that particular case, I use the service loader utility to retrieve all instances of the banking application interface. And from all those banking application uh, instances, I call uh, application.execute, which triggers the logic of my banking application. Uh, to give you more insight on what is the module for the banking server, this is the disc Jigsaw description of the banking server. 
It requires only Java logging from the JDK modules. It exports some packets uh, to the external world, meaning that other modules can make use of those packages. And it also provides two services that can be implemented by other modules. One service is the banking application service, which is implemented by banking, application, banking applications. And the other one is the banking protocol service, which is implemented by banking protocols. And we have two concrete implementations of the banking protocol interface. One is for the fixed protocol, which is in a separate co project called fixed protocol. If you look into the module descriptor of that protocol, we see that it provides an implementation of that protocol, which is uh, provided by the fixed protocol class. This fixed protocol class is fairly simple. It implements the banking protocol service. Uh, and in the execute method, I just print out that I sent some message through the fixed protocol. Uh, the banking server additionally uh, has an interface called banking application, which is implemented by banking applications that would like to execute some uh, logic and potentially use some of those protocol implementations provided by the banking server. Uh, and also the banking server has a protocol service that's used by those applications to send a packet over a per particular protocol. Uh, again, here in this protocol service, I use the service loader utility to retrieve all implementations of uh, the banking protocols. And for each one, of each one of them, I check whether the protocol name matches the name of that protocol. And if that's the case, I send the packet over that protocol. Now, to demonstrate how this works, I have a demo application. And my demo application uh, implements the banking application service. It uh, prints something to the standard output. It creates a packet using the fixed protocol. Uh, the concrete packet is omitted because we don't care about what is the, st the structure of our protocol. And I also get the protocol service from the banking server and call send packet. Now, if I compile all those modules, uh, I've already pre-compiled the modules for uh, the banking server and the two protocols. I would like to recompile my um, demo application. And the way I do that is by calling Java C minus module path modules. In the modules directory, I've already compiled modules for the banking server and the protocols. And then I also specify that additionally, I would like to compile the demo application uh, along with the module info file that's specified by, that, by, that, by this module. I would recompile this. And if I execute uh, the banking server, with already the demo application deployed. I would see that uh, my demo application is discovered by the banking server and it sends a message over the fixed protocol. Now, this is uh, how the banking server works in general. Now, imagine that we have a, a scenario where uh, we have a SIP client. Let's say we have a banking chat server somewhere in the bank. And that banking application server supports uh, the XMPP protocol in two versions, 1.2 and uh, 2.0, for example. And let's say that in my banking server, I would like to provide support for uh, XMPP 1.1 version of that banking chat application. In order to do that, I need to provide first uh, a protocol implementation for XMPP that deploys in the banking server. And that protocol implementation is provided by the XMPP protocol class that implements the banking protocol service. And inside the execute method, uh, what I do is basically I create an SSL uh, socket client in the same manner as we saw in the slides. So basically here I, I specify the trust store, the trust store password. I specify here the most significant thing is that my SIP client supports version XMPP 1.1. Now, I also have an example of the server. Let's imagine that this is some chat server running somewhere uh, on the bank. And if I open uh, the server to see how is it implemented, I can see that this server basically provides support for two versions of the XMPP protocol, 1.1 and 1.2. Now, when I start the server and communicate with it through the, through the client, as you can see, the matching protocol here is XMPP 1.1. So basically what I would expect to see is that the negotiated protocol in that case is XMPP 1.1. In order to see uh, if that's the case, first thing I'll do is I'll start the server. 
then I'll go back to my demo application and here I'll change the protocol to XMPP. This is the name of the protocol specified by my XMPP client protocol implementation. Then I'll need to go and recompile my demo application in the same manner using Java C. And if I run that, I'll see basically that uh, the client sends an XM XMPP protocol packet and that the negotiated protocol is XMPP 1.1. As you can see, uh, using ALPN is fairly straightforward. You just need to uh, provide two, uh, two, uh, two calls to a method called set application protocols, both on the client and on the server side. Now imagine another scenario where we have a much more complex uh, DTLS server running in the bank. Let's imagine that that's another chat server that communicates over UDP and that that DTLS server runs somewhere on the bank. For the DTLS server, I have another uh, server running. And that server basically is fairly complex because it takes into account a lot of additional uh, tricks that need to be adapted into the DTLS um, implementation. However, the most significant thing is the way I create the SSL engine class here in the create SSL engine method. First, I get an instance of DTLS. Then I specify some parameters. In that particular case, I need to specify the list of trust stores, the list of key stores, and a secure random implementation used to generate this, the shared secret. In that particular case, I don't specify them. Then I create an SSL engine instance. Uh, I set some parameters on that engine instance, and I return it. Um, basically, I'll start the DTLS server. And also on the banking server, I would like to provide a DTLS client that communicates with that server. That's yet another protocol implementation, which is provided by the SIP protocol class. And the SIP protocol class uh, is also fairly complex because during the handshake, as I already said, you need to take into account a lot of tweaks. You can take uh, that example from the OpenJDK 9 test suite. But the essential bit here, again, is the create SSL engine method which basically shows you that it's pretty much the same to create uh, SSL engine instance for DTLS on the client side. Uh, when I run, when I go to my demo application again to change the used protocol, here I'll specify SIP, which is the protocol provided by that client. Again, I'll recompile my application. I'll run that. And basically here, my demo application sends some packet to, to DTLS to the, over the SIP protocol. Uh, basically here, I have a non-blocking mode of operation. So here, I need to have good synchronization when I, between the timing when I start my server and client so I can see some packets flowing. And that's pretty much it. So now, if I'm to discuss the rest of the security enhancements at, at a glance, uh, apart from the TLS extensions that we just saw, we have another interesting feature in JDK 9, which is called OCSP Staplink. OCSP is a protocol that allows you to check on the client whether the certificate is revoked or not using the certificate authority. Meaning that, for example, if a certificate has been stolen or for some reason uh, has expired, for for example, the OCSP protocol uh, can be used on by the SSL client to do that certificate checking during the TLS negotiation process. Uh, the server typically caches OCSP responses. Um, and basically, OCSP Staplik is an optimization technique that allows you to reduce the number of requests that the client sends to the certificate authority. You can imagine that, for example, if a server has thousands of clients and each of those clients has to send a request to the certificate authority that can be very uh, network consuming. And for that reason, OCSP Staplink comes in place. Uh, it basically provides a capability for the TLS server to do the certificate revocation checking using the OCSP protocol. So th it's the SSL server that communicates via OCSP and not the client. And also the SSL server typically caches the OCSP responses that are returned from the certificate authority. That effectively reduces the number of responses from the OCSP server because 
every time the client needs to do a uh, certificate revocation checking, it goes through the server, which eventually might have cached OCSP responses. And in order to enable OCSP stoplink when you have a client server communication, you need to set two properties on the client and on the server. Um, on the client, you need to, to set basically the jdk.tls.client enable status request extensions equals to true. Uh, and also you need to set another property which is uh, compson net SSL check revocation equals true. This you need to set it on the uh, SSL client and on the SSL server to enable OCSP stapling. Uh, you need to set another property which is JDK TLS server enable status request extension equals true. This is the only thing you need to do in order to enable OCSP stapling during the TLS negotiation process. Another interesting uh, feature in JDK 9 is that now we have PK S12 as the default key store type in Java 9. Before Java 9, we had the so-called Java key stores, which was a proprietary format uh, in Java. However, uh, it was decided that the JKS format is a bit uh, vendor specific. So they decided to switch that default format to PKCS 12 uh, types of um, key stores which is, of course, much more interoperable with other applications that are not written in Java, for example. Um, also, another interesting thing about PKCS 12 is that it provides support for stronger cryptographic algorithms, which is uh, a limitation in JKS. Uh, and as I said already, it provides better interoperability with other systems typically not written in Java. And there, are, uh, uh, there is a set of other smaller enhancements which is, for example, uh, the ability to leverage CPU instructions that are provided for the cryptographic GHash and RSA algorithms, which are provided at the hardware level. Uh, also, we have uh, uh, a new secure random uh, implementation, uh, a family of new secure random implementations that can be used when you uh, establish the TLS negotiation process. Also, SHA-1 certificates are disabled for certificate validation. This basically is done because uh, SHA-1 certificate validation uh, may expose some security vulnerabilities to your application. And the SHA-1 uh, cryptographic uh, algorithms are already quite old and vulnerable to attacks. And also there is uh, the, the, the default provider in the JDK provides an implementation of a series of SHA-3 hash algorithms, which are SHA-3, 256, 512, and so on and so forth. So there is a new implementation of those series of algorithms. And as a summary, as you can see, in JDK 9, we have some interesting security enhancements and features, uh, which you might adopt in practice if you need to. Um, another interesting thing that we have now in JDK 10, which comes out this month as a general availability, is that Oracle has decided to expose its certificate authorities uh, in Open JDK. Uh, the certificate authorities which were part in JDK uh, pre-Java 9 were basically a list of certificate authorities that were uh, designated by the so-called Oracle Root Certificate Program. And now that list of certi certificate authorities is available in the CA certs file, which is available uh, in JDK 9, Open JDK 9. Also, there, are, uh, there is a number of new enhancements coming to future Java releases. Uh, part of them, as we saw, is the support for newer versions of the protocols for TLS, DTLS. And also we have uh, several upcoming Java enhancement proposals for stronger cryptographic algorithms that you can see uh, in the official Oracle documentation. And the majority of those enhancements that we saw related to the TLS support uh, in JDK 9. And yeah, hopefully we'll see much better support for TLS and other security enhancements in the JDK. Any questions? On TLS and security in general. If not, then thank you for attention. <laughs>